<laughs> you can't talk unless you've seen the movie. <laughs> There's nothing in it. What am I doing? <laughs> Josh! Hey, welcome back to our stupid reaction of Corbin. I'm Rick. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter for more juicy content. Thanks for your Follow us on Instagram, like button. You know what's more disconcerting than that? When you go to take a drink, there's nothing there. If you go to take a drink, for example, like you think it's a glass of milk and it turns out to be orange juice. That's disconcerting. Why would I... Why wouldn't I know what it is? Have you never done that where you've been somewhere and you no. reach for something and you grab the wrong beverage? I don't reach beverage. for random things. You don't have more than one beverage Except at Except when I put my hand down somebody's pants and I'm just like okay with whatever You've I You've never find. been that a breakfast at a restaurant or a family breakfast of some kind and you have coffee, milk, juice, water. Why do I have four drinks? Because they're all breakfast beverages that are often served at a at brunch. At the same time. Yes. No. Today we got a video. This is actually called How Ravi Shankar Sitar Became an American Obsession. George Harrison and the Beatles. Well, we don't even need to watch it. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Uh, there's probably a little more to it than that, but that's probably definitely an element. Because uh, I think he was a big deal before then, though. Not in America. <laughs> Here we go. 1960s were an explosive, endlessly intriguing decade for music, thanks in large part to one man. I'm not talking about Elvis, Jimi Hendrix, or the Beatles, but instead a sitar player from India. Ravi Shankar would end up changing the course of Western music. He was a catalyst for the psychedelic revolution. You don't have Sgt. Peppers and Beyond for the Beatles so without Ravi Shankar. He regret it? There's Rich Harrison. He just says, why did he regret it, by the way? Why did he regret it? Ravi Shankar was born in India in 1920. Wait, Ravi Shankar is Indian? From an age, he was part of a dance group alongside his brother, Uday Shankar. They toured Europe and America, dancing for and educating audiences. Eventually, at age 18, he quit touring to study sitar. After six rigorous years of training, Ravi moved to Mumbai and composed for the Indian People's Theater Association. Shankar was invited into the Soviet Union in 1954 as part of a cultural delegation. One year later, he was invited to perform a demonstration in New York City. Ravi resigned from his post at All India Radio and focused on touring the UK, Germany, and the US. Keep in mind, this was 1956, when the biggest song on the radio in the States was Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis. The stole black people's music. Rock experimentation and the foreign wave were still only on the horizon. It was around this time that Ravi befriended the founder of World Pacific Records, Richard Bach, and recorded albums on his label. Any relation to Bach, the composer? Three Ragas in 1956. Ravi was playing for smaller audiences. It wasn't until the 60s that artists began to take note of Ravi's sound. And the assimilation didn't start with the Beatles or any rock group. Ha! It actually gained traction <laughs> with a jazz artist. John Coltrane, to be exact. On his 1961 album, Africa Brass, Coltrane replicated the sound of the tabla, an Indian drum played with your palms and fingers. A key component to Ravi's instrumental lineup. To accomplish this, Coltrane hired two bass players to mirror the sound. He once told a journalist, His music moves me. I'm certain that if I recorded with him, I'd increase my possibilities tenfold. Mm. John never did get to record with Ravi, though he did name his second son after him. Wow. And now we reach a turning point for Ravi's sitar music in the West 1965. The Birds recorded at the same studio as Shankar. Who the hell are the Birds? David Crosby got to see Ravi What's their song? Live. Really? He What's was their a song? vocal proponent of his music. The Birds' advocacy for Ravi would soon reach the ears of Beatles member George Harrison. George was immediately taken with the sounds of the sitar. While recording a new Beatles song, Norwegian Wood, George would make an impulse decision to add an improvised sitar layer onto the track. This would be the first known rock song to utilize a sitar. That is correct. Track. 
along with numbers by the Yardbirds and the Kinks, would jumpstart a sitar wave that took over the West. The next year, 1966, was an explosive time for this music, now coined as Raga Rock. Hundreds of pop and rock songs would be influenced by Ravi. What a song. Ravi became an icon for this growing psychedelic rock movement. And bolstered up by his friendship with George Harrison, he became the world's most famous Indian musician of the 60s. In 1967, he opened up a Western branch of the Kanara School of Music in LA. Ravi Krieger, the guitarist for The Doors, studied music here and fell in love with the sound, employing it on songs like The End, and Indian Summer. In 1967, the sitar fad was taken to new heights when guitar company Dan Electro introduced the choral electric sitar, an instrument that made it easier than ever Do you know about for guitarists that? No. to tap into that exotic Indian sound. Ravi's influence and the raga rock genre had many unique characteristics outside of using the sitar. Notable attributes were a drone element, traditionally provided by the tambora or harmonium, use of Indian scales, lyrical themes related to mysticism, and the use of repetitive phrasings. There were definitely other elements at play during this time. What? Specifically in California, where the drug lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD, was exploding, and it wasn't going to be illegal for another two years. The psychedelic properties of acid made this foreign Oh man, those hippies love that stuff. <laughs> hippies were infatuated, not just- I love you, mom and dad. <laughs> music, but Eastern culture and religious spirituality. Many associated the meditative and spiritual nature of Indian classical music with the euphoria and surreal effects of psychedelics. Drugs played a major role in the rise of raga rock, and Ravi was burdened with its connection to the sitar. Mm. Ravi's first sign of hesitation regarding the fashionable use of the was sitar Woodstock, in Western probably. music actually coincided with the first use of the sitar in Western music, Norwegian Wood by the Beatles. The last minute improvisational manner of using the sitar is one that's faced some criticism. In a 1966 issue of Crawdaddy, critic Sandy Perlman said, if used only in the interest of exoticism, it can quickly become not particularly justifiable. Mm. Since the sitar simply echoes Lennon's guitar melody, its presence conveys gimmicky orientalism and not much else. Ravi himself seemed to be shocked to hear his native instrument being used in popular music and also being played incorrectly. Gotcha. I couldn't believe it. It sounded so strange. Just imagine some Indian villager trying to play the violin when you know what it should sound like. Mm. Even Harrison himself admitted that the sitar on the song was very rudimentary. I didn't know how to tune it properly, and it was a very cheap sitar to begin with. This example is indicative of the criticism with a lot of raga rock. Well, I'm afraid that uh, this, this sudden interest that there seems to be now might go away as suddenly but on the other hand it makes me it will make me very happy if i see that uh, some people take true interest and learn properly it's worth noting that one of the only people to fully embody the culture and meaning behind indian classical music was actually george harrison after norwegian wood came out his admiration with indian culture didn't stop but instead triggered him to immerse they went to in india indian music and studied and under him Shankar was taken aback by Harrison's devotion to the instrument and realized it wasn't just a fashion for the Beatles member. In 1968, 
Harrison went to India to take lessons from Shankar. Yep. It was this lifelong friendship that was the catalyst for the success of Raga Rock and Indian influence on the West. However, the clash between Ravi's world and that of the West persisted. Ravi recounts being horrified after playing a successful set at Monterey Pop Festival in I think 1967 we've seen that. Uh, when Jimi Hendrix set fire to his guitar. That was too much for me. In our culture, yeah. we have such respect for musical instruments. They are like part of God. In another concert, I can see why that, for an Ravi Indian that would be <laughs> finished jarring. Yeah. The crowd of rock fans broke into applause. Shankar responded. If you like our tuning, I hope you will enjoy the playing more. Ravi's relationship <laughs> with hippie culture came to a boiling point at the famous 1969 Woodstock Festival, a performance that became one of his greatest regrets, calling it a terrifying experience. Ravi likened the audience to water buffaloes in India submerged in mud. <laughs> Playing for a mass audience of tripping hippies seemed to be the final straw for Ravi. After Woodstock, he wouldn't return to the U.S. for over a year and a half, oh, wow. distancing himself from the whole Raga Rock movement. It makes me feel rather hurt when I see the association of drugs with our music. Mm. People would come to my concerts stoned, and they would sit in the audience drinking coke and making out with their girlfriends. I found it very humiliating. And there I can were see why he would, coming from an Indian. Away. It was a terrible experience at the time. That people often think that... Um... Uh, there must be an intimate connection between Indian music and drugs, maybe because of the bizarre sound and the, to play that way. Bizarre? Uh, appreciate it, at least. Yikes. I don't think Ravi was prepared to enter the sphere of Western popular culture, especially in the context of the drug scene at the time. <laughs> Already, Ravi was decades older than this counterculture generation. Yeah. He had committed the first part of his life to mastering his instrument, making a name for himself in the classical community and then sought to educate the world on these sounds. His world was not one of sex, drugs, or rock and roll. By the 70s, use of the sitar in popular music had decreased, but the spirit of raga rock continued well into the 70s and beyond. It's been an integral evolution for modern psychedelic rock, with artists like Animal Collective, Krongbin, MGMT, King Gizzard, and Spangle. All artists <laughs> All of them. who, whether they even know of one it of or not, <laughs> adopt many of the same characteristics established in Raga Rock. Although he did have regrets, Ravi was still proud of what he managed to accomplish during this time. After all, he helped to forever alter the course of Western music. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. Great video. Really informative. Yeah, well done. Very informative video. A bunch video. of stuff that obviously did not no, and also I hadn't ever thought about like the 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 element of when they first started and was it George Harrison playing it and the was that who was yeah who George was Harrison played it in Norwegian Wood in and Norwegian. it was just very simple it's just melody replication but you can easily understand why especially there's so many things that was like coming from what we know of Indian culture and especially Indian classical music culture mm -hmm. and their respect for the music and the instrument yeah and then to force it into the hippie culture <laughs> yeah <laughs> not that they forced it in but the fact that those two things kind of just kind of collided at the exact same time two basically opposite kind of cultures yeah and harrison harrit all of the beatles but especially harrison they were very vocal and i mean i think that's probably one of the reasons among many i think the primary reason harrison and the beatles went to india and studied under ravi shankar was because of his admiration for the music. For sure. And the expansion of their understanding of musical possibilities, as well as their openness to seeing what else could be expanded in consciousness that that classical Indian music was connected to with Hinduism. And it, it just happened for the Beatles to coincide with the the world of hallucinogenics at the time yeah. but it wasn't predominant and so it wouldn't surprise me if that was also one of the things that you know i i my expo i first heard the name of ravi shankar i was two or three probably because my dad's biggest influence was the beatles the first songs i ever learned i learned how to harmonize i learned everything about musicality from my dad's music and from the beatles and i used to sing with the, my dad with the beatles first song i ever sang was the beatles and 
the first time I ever heard a sitar was on Norwegian Wood and the rest of the other Beatles uh, albums. And particularly George, my, my, my dad just educated me on the fact that they were so enamored with this instrument and wanted to learn more about the instrument. It is a shame that more people just used it as a novelty. And even Harrison agreed. He said, I, I just was, I loved the instrument. And I was trying to do the best with it what I could. And that's why I wanted to go learn more. But I could, I could absolutely see, it would be comparable to me today of seeing someone like Astaji Zakir Hussein, seeing somebody set fire to a set of drums and him thinking, what are you doing? Yeah. It would absolutely be tough on the sensitivities. Yeah, and because it's a classical and I'm sure instrument with a completely different mindset about the respect of the music. And I'm sure George Harrison, and I think he said it, probably regrets how he incorporated it as opposed to like having Ravi actually come play it. I think that's why he did it. Um, I mean, one of the beautiful things about it, musical expression <laughs> is the creativity and the fact that you can take something and use it outside of the norms that it's typically used for, or just try to experiment with it. Mm -hmm. But it really shows you how deeply he respected Ravi Shankar and music and the instrument yeah. by going and studying with him. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he uh, would probably, if he like could do it differently, he would probably have had Ravi come and actually of play course. as opposed to, cause it's like, what do you, what Shankar said? Yeah. It's like watching somebody play the violin that's never played it before. It's like, that's, or if like it can be extreme, like it could almost seem cultural appropriation wise. Like if somebody, if there's a native American instrument, and I wanted to do right. something I had no idea how to play. And I right. went, home, baba, home, or like, Right. And it'd be like, what, what are you, are you doing? doing? Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to like having a Native American person who can actually know how to play it, come play it on it and beautifully incorporate the two cultures. But kind of, so <laughs> that element, I totally, and I didn't know that it was just George Harrison yeah. kind of just fucking around on a, on a and sitar. to show you the depth of it, for any of you who don't know, do a deep dive into the history of the Beatles and the relationship of... In, in Ravi Shankar and in Indian music. So the the importance of Sgt. Pepper as an album yeah. can't be overstated because prior to that album, records were just a compilation of songs with some hits. Yeah. And each song was just, is it a hit? We're going to have a slow song. We're going to have a dance song. Sgt. Pepper was the first concept album yeah. where song one to song last Side A and B was a full experience for you, including the artwork on the album that stood as a singular piece of musical art and pop music. Every album that's come after that, where you have an album cover that matches it, that's not just highlighting the artists, that has uh, songs that blend and go one into the other and tell a whole story from start to finish. It used to be back in the 70s after Sgt. Pepper. Everybody's album, The Stones did it, Led Zeppelin did it. What you would do is you would lay down, you put your headphones on, you'd start the album and you would just go on the journey of the album, not just listen to the individual songs. Yeah. That's because of what happened to them having their mind opened, not just with psychedelics, but to Indian classical music and taking that to new places. That's why Hey Jude got airplay as a seven minute song. No song was longer than two and a half minutes. Yeah. And people said to the Beatles, Hey Jude will never get airplay. They said, we don't care. We're releasing it. And you have a seven minute song like Hey Jude because they were looking at Indian classical music going, these pieces go on forever. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. It's, the influence <laughs> is unmeasurable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great video. Lot great of stuff video. To, uh... And the birds, you know the birds. What song? what song? You'll know two immediately. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I know that is Bob Dylan. Yeah, he wrote it. They covered it. Uh, and then you know this. To everything, turn, turn, uh, turn. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the bird. Gotcha. Yep. Um, great video as always. Uh, let us know what you thought about it. Any yeah. other information, obviously. Great video. I would love to. Uh, she, I know she's touring. I would love to actually talk to and I was go to a his Absolutely. daughter's concert. Absolutely, I, I would love that. Brilliant sitar, and we've seen her. We've obviously. seen her, but I would love to. I know she's kind of does tours and stuff. Um, I would love to because just just I'd love, hear to, I'd love to know her take yeah. on it as well because she would obviously have you know firsthand memories of those kinds of things and the influence and what she thinks. Now about it just it. makes me sad. <laughs> like what? Like knowing what we know about it, like. Watching 
Zakir Hussein, see somebody set tablas on fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be disappointed. I'm sure like, Indians would what? have been as well. <laughs> just, to, just to have seen him at like a, you know, to see, it would be comparable to seeing Ustadi uh, Zakir Hussein at some like really rank grunge festival where everybody's just peeing on the stage and you're like, do you guys even have any idea what is on stage with you right now? Yeah. I, I can absolutely Such understand different that. different musical yeah. cultures for sure. Could totally understand. Uh, anyway, so that was great. <laughs> Let us know what you thought down below. Just...